Hello, my name is Stephanie, and in today's video, we're going to talk about the eight most common questions that I get as a draft horse owner. My hope is that this information will be helpful for you if you are new to horses or new to drafts and considering bringing one of these amazing creatures into your life. So just a quick note, when I'm using the term draft, I'm talking about the larger draft horse breeds, but I don't want to forget to acknowledge that there are draft horses that are on the smaller end of the spectrum, like Gypsy Vanners, Halflingers, and fjords. But a lot of what I'm talking about is more geared toward the bigger horses. So one common question I get is, you know, I'm a heavier rider. Does that mean I, I need a draft horse or the biggest draft horse? There are formulas out there that you may have found online that talk about the percentage of the rider's weight in relationship to the horse's weight. Um, and some of those can be really helpful jumping off points. What I would say is if you are a larger rider, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have an 18 or 19 hand shire in order to be able to ride a horse. There are a lot of very stout, shorter drafts and draft crosses out there that could be a good fit. I've even met um, some foundation bred quarter horses that are very stocky, very big bone, very stout that can comfortably handle uh, a larger rider. It's not just about the size of the horse. It's not just about the height of the horse either. There's a lot of factors that go into making a horse a suitable match for a larger rider and you know that's things like confirmation of the horse typically it's felt that horses with longer backs are a little more vulnerable in terms of weight distribution than horses with shorter backs the fitness of that horse is a big deal if that horse hasn't been carrying a rider for years if they've been sitting out in pasture they're going to need to develop those muscles in order to be able to carry any kind of rider comfortably um, and then rider balance uh, we can't forget the rider side of the equation too. You know, if you are not a balanced rider, you can soar a horse's back regardless of your size. And so, you know, if you're a newer rider, a newer horse owner, chances are you're still learning to develop your balance, your seat, how to post a trot, things like that. You know, get in some lessons and talk to a riding instructor, horse trainer, um, experienced horse people to get some feedback on this. Uh, but the short answer to that question is you don't necessarily need to have the biggest, tallest horse on the block if you are a larger rider. There can potentially be a variety of horses that aren't necessarily super tall that could also potentially be a good fit for you as well. Another question I get is how much should I expect to pay? It varies depending on the age of the horse, the experience of the horse, whether or not you are looking at a specific breed or a horse that has papers and your geographic region too. What I've noticed from kind of watching the market for the last few years, drafts and draft crosses have become a lot Lot more popular and the demand for them has gone up and so the prices for them on average seem to have gone up as well and it's not uncommon to see a draft or a draft cross uh, with a decent amount of training and experience in the high four figures low five figures and on up again if you are looking at a horse that is considered grade which means that horse doesn't have it's not a purebred it doesn't have papers um, you're probably going to be paying less than a horse that does and if you're looking at your specialty breeds, especially ones that are very popular, like Gypsy Vanners and Frisians, you know, you're definitely in the five figures or more. And one thing that I would encourage you to think about when you are looking at your budget is the cost to have that horse transported to you if you're looking at a horse that's potentially out of your area. Uh, let's say, you know, you're looking at a horse that's $5,000 that's located in the Midwest. Um, you could easily pay several thousand dollars just to have that horse transported out to you in Seattle, Washington. You may say, you know what, I'd actually be better off upping my budget and shopping for a horse locally, given that I'm going to pay, you know, such a significant amount of money to have that horse shipped, um, especially if you're going to be flying out to, to meet that horse, to try that horse out, which I strongly encourage you to do if you are new to horses and you're buying a horse for the first time. You know, a lot of people get screwed buying sight unseen. So I would definitely encourage you to make those efforts and all of that can determine what your ultimate budget ends up being. Connected to that is the question of, are draft horses more expensive to keep? I did an entire video on this um, that I'll link down in the description and up here that talks about the difference um, for me in my area of keeping a draft horse versus keeping a light horse. There is an increase in farrier fees. So to have my horse's feet taken care of. One thing I will say is that if your horse needs shoes and if your horse is what's called a hard keeper where they need a lot of extra hay or feed to keep their weight on, you can be paying quite a bit more every month 
to keep that horse in good health. Another thing to consider is, you know, drafts are big horses. So you could potentially be paying more for a larger paddock if you're boarding or a larger um, stall or pasture situation, whatever that, that may be just to keep your horse um, happy and content. And drafts have a reputation sometimes for being a little bit hard on fencing. So if you are keeping your horse on your own property and you're gonna be setting up fencing, I would do some research on some uh, draft tolerant fencing. I keep Fame in a um, paddock situation and he has aluminum pipe panels. And I've never actually really had an issue with him damaging those panels to the extent that I have to replace them or anything like that. But, you know, a lot of horses will lean on a panel to scratch their butt and they can very easily when they're very large, put a significant dent in those panels. When I go camping with him, we recently tried out some of the sort of finer gauge portable paddock panels. They were not a good fit. He's too big of a guy. And it's too easy for him to, to bump those around and potentially get himself hurt. So there are some considerations with fencing that if you're shopping for a horse, it's worth talking to the seller to find out what kind of fencing does this horse respect? What are they used to? And that may impact your decision on how and where to keep that horse in terms of board. Do they need special tack? I get this question a lot. Maybe, yes, no, it depends. You know, when you get into like the 17, 18, 19 hand draft size horses, my friends that have like 18 hand Clydesdales, you know, she's riding in a draft saddle at that point. I consider myself pretty fortunate. Fame is 16 2, and he rides in a wide tree Western saddle, which is pretty standard. I can find a lot of saddle options for him. He's not difficult to fit. And it's not really just about height either. It has to do with the shape of their, their wither and their back conformation. What I've noticed with a lot of draft stuff is that you need to do your shopping online and you may have to do some things custom. So Fame has a very large head and I have to have a custom head stall or bridle for him. The reins I've had to have custom made because his neck is very long. And so your standard uh, like 10 foot reins just don't cut it for us. I feel like I'm reaching way out in front of me. They're too short. And the other thing that I do have to find a specialty online is bits. So, you know, your, your typical light horses are like, you know, I think four to five inch size bits. And Fame is like five and a half, six plus inch bits and of course the bigger horses potentially may need even larger like six and a half inch bits and so i definitely have fewer options when it comes to um, bits and just a lot of tack in general so that's definitely something to look into when you're shopping for a particular horse you know find out what size saddle they're currently riding in if they need any kind of specialty tack i haven't found that you have to spend a ton more money uh, even for custom stuff but you do have to look a little bit harder and it sometimes takes more time to get what you need. Where you're likely going to be shelling out a lot more money is with your trailer. Your bigger draft horse breeds are going to need a bigger trailer. And in the United States, that usually means shopping for what's called a warm blood height trailer. Standard horse trailers in the US are seven feet tall. And I have found that when you hit about 16 hands or bigger, uh, a lot of those horses tend to be more comfortable in what are seven foot six high trailers, your warm blood trailers. And one important thing to note when you're shopping for trailers is that the width of the stalls can really vary based on manufacturers. Uh, Trails West, which is the brand that I have, they offer a warm blood height trailer. They also offer a warm blood package that includes the taller height as well as wider stalls. Your slant load trailers tend to have less width than your straight load trailers. So do your research, check the measurements and the specs on the trailers that you're shopping for. But keep in mind that you are probably going to need a bigger trailer if you've got a bigger draft horse. And if you are looking at a horse that is 18 hands or higher, there is a chance that you may need something even larger than a warm blood height trailer. My friend who has an 18 plus hand Clydesdale has a warm blood trailer that her horse is quickly outgrowing. And so it is even possible to have custom made draft height trailers that are even bigger than seven foot six. I have yet to see these, but I know that they exist. And as I mentioned before, you are likely going to spend a lot more money. I had to up my budget for a used trailer when I was shopping a couple years ago from about six or seven thousand dollars to over ten thousand dollars just simply because they're harder to find, there's not as many, and of course they tend to cost a fair bit more. Are they comfortable to ride? I get this question all the time. Uh, generally, I would say, yeah. A lot of people describe riding draft horses like riding a big couch, you know, that they're very comfortable. Your legs are out, 
usually a bit wider because they're they're bigger in the barrel. And so if you've got hip issues, that might not be super comfortable. I don't know. What I really notice is the length of his strides. He's got huge strides and the movement in the saddle is quite pronounced and quite big. That's huge rocking sort of motion. And I do find that when we trot and when we lope, we take up a heck of a lot more space, a lot faster than lighter horses. So you know, even the biggest arenas can feel quite small. Another thing I've noticed, like with my horse in particular, his seated trot isn't super comfortable. You know, they're not typically light footed horses. They tend to be pretty heavy footed. I think that's kind of the fun of riding draft horses. Um, but if you're looking for that very gentle kind of springy seated trot, I don't know. I don't know if a draft is going to be a good fit for you or not. Uh, but posting the trot is super fun. His lope, I think, is amazing. And of course, when you walk, you just cover a heck of a lot of ground with those big strides of his. So I really like riding drafts. I find them comfortable. I would encourage you to try out whatever horse you're interested in buying um, because every horse has slightly different conformation and different speeds to kind of determine if it's a comfortable ride for you. Are there special health issues that you need to be worried about when you're looking at drafts? Uh, yes, uh, I would say probably the three most common ones that I've seen are uh, PSSM1. It's also called EPSM. It stands for polysaccharide storage myopathy. You can Google it. There is a genetic test that I've noticed a lot of sale ads now are, are saying, oh, this horse is PSSM1 negative as a selling point. I had FAME tested at UC Davis and, you know, it's like a $40 or $50 test. I'll include a link down below. You can read a little bit more about uh, PSSM1 and what it involves. But it's definitely something that would have to be managed uh, very carefully with diet. And it could be a deal breaker in terms of a horse being sound. So you definitely uh, want to be aware of it. Another uh, issue that I've seen in some drafts is what's called CPL, which is chronic progressive lymphedema. It affects their legs. Again, it's something that can happen with certain breeds more commonly than others. And I encourage you to do your research on it. Talk to the seller if they've seen ev any evidence of it. Check out the horse's legs that you're looking to buy. The third most common one that I tend to hear about with horses that have feathers on their legs is feather mites. This is a less severe issue than the other two, but it can be very annoying. It can be very bothersome to try and get rid of. There are some treatments for it, but I've heard some feathered draft owners talk about how obnoxious it is and how much of a pain in the butt they can be to try and get rid of. So that's something that you can also check for when you're out looking for horses. One thing that I noticed when I was shopping is that there were a lot of draft horses that just had very poor foot care. And I actually talked to my farrier about this before I purchased my horse because I wanted to find out what his philosophy was on draft horse foot care. And I learned a lot from him and his approach is basically that, you know, you don't treat them wildly different from light horses in terms of the, the shape of the foot and how you trim them. And I don't know that every farrier feels that way. So it might be worth talking to some farriers in your area in advance uh, and maybe have a farrier look at the horse that you're looking to buy. Some of our drafty guys, you know, their foot care gets neglected. They end up with very splayed out dishy kind of feet that need some rehabbing. But when you are shopping for horses, you know, it is important to know that the health of the horse's feet uh, can make a tremendous impact on the overall health of the horse and the soundness or the ability for you to ride that horse. Even if the seller says, oh, that's no big deal. He just needs a trim. You know, you may want to do some some more investigative research. You may want to get some radiographs and some x-rays of their feet just to make sure that everything's OK in there because healthy feet make a healthy horse. So something to be aware of. Another question I get, I, I don't really get it so much outright, but it's sort of this implied thought process. And that is, you know, is it true that drafts are calmer and therefore safer? And I definitely will acknowledge that they, you know, drafts have that gentle giant stereotype. And a lot of people are very attracted the, to them as a result. I know a lot of people that really prefer them for trail mounts because a lot of them are very level headed. They're very calm. They don't seem to be as reactive as maybe some other breeds of horses. You know, my own horse fame um, embodies some of those stereotypes. That being said, I would not take that as carte blanche to just purchase any draft and you will be fine. I think you still really have to do your due diligence um, because, you know, horses have their own personalities. Training can be hugely impactful on how a horse behaves, life experience, what that horse has been exposed to, all that kind of stuff really 
I think is more important than just looking at a breed. So I would encourage you to investigate those things. Don't just assume that because a horse is a draft horse that he's you know, automatically beginner friendly. When I was out shopping for horses, I actually met a, a good number of drafts that were definitely not beginner friendly horses. Um, they were a bit spooky. They hadn't been maybe trained or socialized well. You know, when you have a horse that size, uh, that can be extra dangerous. So, you know, again, I would encourage you to not put a ton of stock just in breed. And again, this is where having an experienced professional helping you with the shopping process can really save you a lot in terms of financial or safety issues down the road. Another question that I get asked is which breed is best, Clydesdale or a Shire or a Percheron or a Drum Horse? What I have found is that comparing breeds is tricky because it seems like when people really get into a breed, they stick with that breed for a long period of time. Finding one person that has had a depth and breadth of experience with drafts, in my experience, has been a little bit harder to find. But what I have had luck doing is going on Facebook and joining a bunch of different breed specific groups. And that can be a great place for you to do your research and ask questions. There are draft specific shows that happen around the United States at different times of the year. That's another thing that you could look into. And I would also encourage you to check out different breed registries. So for example, FAME is registered with the IDHA, which is the International Drum Horse Association. Usually people are thrilled talk to you about their breed and what they love about it and who they think they're a good fit for. So that would kind of be the direction I would point you in. But again, if you're a beginning horse owner, if you're new to horses, if this is going to be your first draft, um, I would encourage you to prioritize a horse that's going to be a good fit for the riding you want to do, that's going to be safe for you, far above breed. So I hope this video was helpful for you guys. If you've got more questions for me, let me know down in the comments below. And of course, you're always welcome to reach out to me on Instagram. Um, if you're into the draft horse thing, if you're into trail riding, if you're into horse camping, I would encourage you to check out some more of my videos, which you can here on the screen. We'll see you next time. Thank you.